<laughs> All righty, looks like we have a lot of questions. Oh, so we could do number one. So you guys know how to make the truth table for number one, that's good. Number two, it does deduce a valid conclusion, 2B. Okay, so 2B, not, not Q and S, not R implies P, not R or not Q. If these three premises are true, what would be a logical conclusion? So what's the first thing you should do? What I told you last week. Change everything to conditional. conditional statements. So you can use modus ponens and the law of syllogism, right? So like this, what, what can I do with this? How do I distribute a negation sign to an and statement? So it's going to be Q, Q or not S. S. That's De Morgan's law. Okay, this is already a conditional statement. How do I change an or statement to a conditional? Well, why don't we just do it over here? How do you change an or statement to a conditional? What's the pattern? Negate the first, leave the second one alone. Morisara, I guess you didn't watch the video, did you? Strike one! If you're going to miss class, especially for sports, you better get on it. Or do I have to send an email to Mr. Look? I think, Mr. Look, if you are watching this video, Morisara didn't keep up with his homework. <laughs> now, nah, there's no way he would watch this video unless I sent it to him. <laughs> and then, how do you change an or statement to a conditional? I just did it. Uh -huh. Negate the first, leave the second one alone. That's the pattern, people. Anyway, it's in the notes. It says, important equivalences. Okay, now, you have three conditional statements. What can you conclude from three conditional statements? Here, let me show you. Look, if you had A implies B, and then B implies C, and then C implies D, what can you conclude? A implies D, right? That's just the law of syllogism, right? So that's what you're going to do here, except you just got to make sure you connect them in the right order, yeah? So, how, Mr. Park, how do I know which one to start with? Well, look, if you're going to use the law of syllogism, see how this one has to match with this one, and then this one got to match with this one. Right? I mean, just look at the pattern of the thing, right? So what? Where, what? So what? Look, look at the three conditions. Here, I'll circle them for you. Here are the three conditional statements. Which one do I start with? Should I start with the R, the Q, the S, the P? What? The R. Why, why, why would you start with R? You don't want to start with R. Look, look, look at the pattern here. You want to start with this one or that one, right? Because only got one of them. See, because the other one's going to match up, right? So. Either going to start with the S or the P. Because look, got two R's here, got the two Q's there, but only got one S and one P. Just like over here, look. Only got one A and one D, but then you got to have these two to match up and these two to match up. So which one do you want to start with? Pick one. I don't, it doesn't matter. P. Okay, let's start with the P. But see, in order, the P doesn't start it, so... We need to contrapositize this. What's the contrapositive of this? Not P, not P implies R. R. Okay, so we got not P implies R. Now, if I'm going to use the law of syllogism, the next statement has to be R implies something. Where can I get that? Hey, right there. So now R implies not Q. And if I'm going to use the law of syllogism again, I got to get not Q implies something. Where can I get that? Hey, right there, not S. So if gorilla implies banana, banana implies armadillo, armadillo implies anaconda, therefore, gorilla implies anaconda. Look, A implies B, B implies C, C implies D, therefore, A implies D, right? It's the same pattern. What if somebody wrote S implies P? Would that be correct also? Yeah, that's yeah because that's the contrapositive of that, which is the same. The contrapositive is logically equivalent. So yes. So some people might start with the, the, not the P, but some people would start with S. It doesn't matter because they're the same thing. Okay, now C. Okay, this, the disjunction, see, this is where I put it in to see if you know what's going on. The disjunction of C and A. What, what, what is disjunction again? Or. That means or. Do I have to write it down again? No. no. Disjunction means or. Conjunction means 
And so, do we have to know that, Mr. Park? Only if you want to get the problem correct. A is a sufficient condition for not D. Now, does that mean A implies not D? Or does that mean not D implies A? Or it doesn't matter? Of course it matters, people. Look at your notes. It's in the notes. A is a sufficient condition for not D. Does that mean A implies not D or not D implies A? A implies not D. And D is a necessary condition for B. So does that mean D implies B or B implies D? B implies D. You guys got that? Mr. Park, I, I can't get it straight. Well, this is, the, this is the secret I teach the math team. See, when you have sufficient condition, when you see sufficient, see how the F's are pointing that way? So that means this implies that. See how it says A is a sufficient condition for not D. So since the F's are pointing that way, it's going to be this implies that. Does that help? And then necessary. Necessary condition. See how the Y is pointing that way? So when you have D is a necessary condition for B, it means B implies D. Or you can make up whatever rule you want, but that's the, that's the rule we use on the math rule. Before, we used to say, the S's point that way. <laughs> but we changed it to the Y, because they said it was confusing or something. Why is that confusing? Because the S's could point that way? I don't know. Okay now, that, okay, now that we have this, the first thing you should do is change this OR to a conditional. How do you change OR to conditional again? Negate the first, leave the second one alone. You have, okay, Mr. Park, is that an important one? Yes, that is super important. In fact, all the equivalences that I wrote on the notes, they're all super important. Okay, now I have three conditional statements, just like this problem here. All you gotta do is match them up using the the law of syllogism. So which one do I start with? I see only one B and one C. So either you're going to start with the B or the C. C. Okay, let's start with the C. So you got not C implies A. So that means you need A implies something. Where can I get A implies something? Right here, so not D. Not D. And then if you're going to use the law of syllogism, then you need not D implies something. Where can I get that? The contrapositive of this. Not D implies B. So if this implies that, that implies that, that implies that, therefore, what can I conclude? Not C implies not D, and there you go. What if somebody wrote B implies C? Would that be correct as well? Yes, because that's the contrapositive. The contrapositive is equivalent to the, the conditional. You guys get it? Are we catching on? Okay, and then I'm glad you didn't write number three out there because I did that one last week. So basically everything else, Mr. Park. Oh, good thing you guys came in for help this morning. Number four, the moon is full. Okay, what do you want to call the moon is full, M or F? M. 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 I said M. Okay, whatever. Or shall we go with W? Okay, F. The moon is full if and only if it is cold. Shall we go with C? Yes. If the goblins are out, so shall we do G or O? If the goblins are not are out, then it is Halloween. It is cold. Il est froid. If it is Halloween, then the moon is not full. Okay, now, before we even start, Mr. Park, this is not a conditional statement. This is a biconditional statement. Yeah, that's actually better. Because see, when you have a conditional statement, it's if this, then that. But when the arrow points both directions, that means you can use it whichever direction you want. So it actually makes it easier, right? Yeah. So you just have to figure out which way you want to use it. What do you think? C. Yeah, why? Why do you think it's going to be C implies F? Because, because you got the C there. Because look, modus ponens. If C implies F, C, therefore, F. That's modus ponens, right? Because of that C there. So we're going to use this by conditional as C implies F. So we got C implies F, then I need F implies something. Where can I get that? The contrapositive of this, right? <coughs> F implies not H. Then I need not H implies something. Where can I get that? The contrapositive of this. Not H implies not G. So putting these three together, what can I conclude? The are not no, no. C implies not G. 
No. C. Therefore, no. not G is the answer. So the goblins are not up. You guys get it? Yes. Oh, I get it, Mr. Park. I have to know statements that are logically equivalent. Exactly. If you don't know your logically equivalent statements, then it, it's pretty much all over but the crying. Okay, number five. Logic is difficult. What do you want to call it? L or D? Okay, logic is difficult or not many students like it. What do you want to call that? Not M or not S? Not many or not student? Not student. Okay, whatever. You guys like being weird. If math is easy, M or E? If math is easy, then logic is not difficult. Many students like logic. Okay, so the first thing you do is symbolize it. And then what should you do? I see an or statement here. Anytime you see an or statement, you can replace it with a conditional. It's, and how do you do that again? This is like the third or fourth time today. Negate the first, leave the second one alone. That's the pattern, people. Okay, now notice that you have an S here. So you're going to want to use modus ponens. That means you want to start started with S implies something. Where can I get S implies something? The first one. A contrapositive of the first one. So S implies D. Then I need D implies something. Contrapositive of this one, right? D implies not E. So putting these two together, what? S implies not, S implies not E. S, therefore, not E. So what, what was E again? What did E stand for? So math is not easy is the answer there. There you go. See, so it doesn't matter what the meanings of the words are. You just symbolize each one, and then you, you go through it like we learned, right? Don't worry about the meaning of the words. Now, the last two problems, these are called logic puzzles, OK? This is just for fun, OK? I'm not, I'm not going to give you logic puzzles on the test. Although, maybe I should, yeah? No, because it's fun. Why, you don't want to have fun taking a test? No, we don't want to have fun. OK, no. OK, let's make the test really hard then instead. <laughs> you guys ever did logic puzzles before? Now, if you went to Iolani from kindergarten, then I know you did logic puzzles. This is in kindergarten. Because when my children bought their homework home, I said, hey, this is a logic puzzle. Mrs. Derby? Oh, yeah. I don't know what they call it, but it's a logic puzzle. Okay? Now, to do number six, logic puzzle. Now, these are just simple kind. Okay? Like, when you, like, you ever go to the airport, and you want to kill time, and then you go to the the magazine store, and then they have logic puzzles. Yeah. Yeah. And then they have pages and pages of, like Sudoku. Sudoku is basically a logic puzzle. That's what it is. You have to think logically. So what you do, what they do in those logic puzzles, they give you a grid. See, but this one's only three by three. The ones that they have at the store is like 20 by 20. OK, now what do we have? We have Moke, Boke, and Croak. And then their coaches are Ike, Mike, and Tyke. So what you do is you sift through this information and you cross out things that are impossible until there's only one cell remaining. So for example, if this is the only cell that's remaining, then that means the runner was Croak and his coach was Pike. So you just keep on crossing out things that are impossible. Now I'm not going to do this for you. I'm not going to do the whole thing for you. I'm just going to get you started. You guys never did logic puzzles before? Okay, let's see. It says, Mike's runner, runner nearly won. Now, we're looking for the winner, right? Mike's runner nearly won. That means Mike's runner did not win. So here's Mike. Cross out everything in his role because his runner didn't win. We're looking for the winner. Mike's runner didn't win. So cross out everything. You guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Okay, next one. This was Boke's fifth race. Okay, we can't do anything with that yet. The blonde-haired <coughs> runner was coached by Tyke. Can you do anything with that yet? No. The runner coached by Ike had not raced before, but this was Boke's fifth race. So what can we conclude from that? Boke well, was not coached by Ike, so we can cross out that column. And you just keep on reading, and then until you, there's only one cell left. Okay, I'll do one more. Moke broke his leg just after the start of the race. That means Moke could not have won. Although some of you are thinking he could hop really fast. <laughs> no, these are world-class runners, people. 
So mold could not have one. So here's mold. Cross out everything in this column. And then you, I'll let you have fun for the last one. The winning runner was bald. Or should we just finish it off? What the heck? Mm -hmm. The winning runner was bald, but then it says the blonde haired runner was coached by type. Yeah, that means type didn't win because he had blonde hair. But the winning runner was bald. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? Type's runner did not win. So here's type. Cross out everything. So there's only one thing left. So that means the winner was Crow and his coach was Ike. This is called a logic puzzle. You just keep crossing out things that are impossible until there's only one thing remaining. You guys ever watch Star Trek? That's what Mr. Spock does. Whatever. And then the last one, okay, this last one I'm definitely not going to do for you. What time is it? Because we have to learn. We're in trouble. Germain, Mike, uh, Michael Germain, Tito, and Marlon. Who are these guys? These are the Jackson 5 people. Oh. You ever heard of the Jackson? But there's only four. That's because I'm leaving out. No, oh, Michael's right there, there man. <laughs> That's because I'm leaving out Jackie. You guys, know, you guys don't know. Yeah, okay. It doesn't matter. These are just names, okay? <laughs> Only one of them is the drummer. When questioned by the agent, the following statements are made. Okay, you can read that. Now, here's the key. If exactly one of these statements is true, who is the drummer? Okay? So here are the statements. You got Michael, Germain, Tito, and Marlon. Okay, Marlon, Michael. Only one of these statements is true. So what you do is you go through them. This is like a guess and check type, type of thing. So here. What, what if we say this is true, Michael's statement is true, and the others are false? How many cases will there be here if exactly one statement is true? Okay, another one would be, what if Jermaine's one is true, but the others are false? Because remember, only one statement can be true. What's another case? Tito's one is true, and the others are false. And finally, what's the last case? Marlon's one is true, and the other three are false. So there's only four possibilities. You go through these one at a time until you hit the right one. That's how you do these puzzles. Okay, I'll, do, I'll just do one over here. So Michael's statement is true. Jermaine is the drummer. That means Jermaine is the drummer now. Okay? That, because that's a true statement. Jermaine, Marlon is the drummer, but that statement is false. So what does that mean? Marlon is not the drummer. Okay? Tito said, I am not the drummer, but his statement is false. So he's the drummer, but then that doesn't make sense because there's only one drummer. So that means this one is wrong. You know what I'm talking about? Because it doesn't make sense. There's only one drummer, and only one of the statements is true. So you go to the next one. So if this is false, true, 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 if that's false, if that's false, do you get the answer? If not, you move to the next one. And you just keep on going until you get the correct one. You know what I'm talking about? You guys can finish this thing, right? Plus got the answer on the bottom. Okay, we only got 13 minutes left to learn. We're in deep trouble. Now, the only thing we have to learn is, how do you, what, what did we do last week? I can't even remember. We determined if an argument is valid or invalid, right? There are three ways. I already told you the first two. Let's go with mode, here's mode and exponents. B implies Q, B, therefore, Q. Now, we already know this is valid. Now, what, what's the first way to prove that it's valid? You make a true table. Whenever these premises are true, if the conclusion comes out true, then it's valid. What's the second way? If the conjunction of the premises, remember what does conjunction mean? If the conjunction of the premises implies the conclusion, this is the conclusion here. If this statement is a tautology, that means the true table comes out true every time, then the argument would be valid, right? That's the second method. But now we got the third method. The third method is called indirect proof. This is fun, people. Okay, now this is this is how indirect proof works. Now, you have to you have to understand what makes a valid argument. An argument is valid if these premises are true. Then that will be true as well. That's what a valid argument is. Okay, so in an indirect proof. We're going to suppose 
that this is false. So, the first line in any indirect proof is, you can, we're going to suppose, suppose that this Q is false. Again, a valid argument is, if these statements are true, then this one will be true also. That's what a valid argument is. But now, we're going to suppose this is false instead. We're going to prove this indirectly. So it doesn't matter what statement I put here. Whatever statement is here, you suppose that it's false. Now, suppose Q is false. What does that mean? This means Q is, I mean, not Q is true. true. I don't know if we, we, we need that. You know what? Never mind. We don't even need that. OK, so we take this into here until we get a contradiction. The key is you want to get a contradiction. And there will be a contradiction because we already know this is a valid argument. Okay? Now, if Q is false, suppose Q is false. If this is false, and this is, what kind of statement is this? Can you get the arrow? This is called a conditional statement. If we assume this conditional statement to be true, can we make any conclusions on what P is? Yeah, P has to be false, right? Because look, if P was true, if you have a conditional statement, if the first one is true and the second one is false, what does that mean? That means it's false, but this statement is true. That's what a premise is. A premise is a statement that is known to be true. So that's why, so now we can solve, so P must be false in premise number one. You guys understand that? P has to be false. Because this, state, this whole statement has to be true. Now, does anybody see a contradiction here? Look, we just figured out that P is false, but what about right here? It says P is true. How can a statement be both true and false? That's a contradiction. And that's what you want. So, contradiction! You should be happy. So you put an exclamation mark. P cannot be both true and false. P cannot be both true and false. Therefore, the argument is valid. And there you go. This is an example of an indirect proof. Also, oh, Mr. Park, we got to write out words. Yes. An indirect proof is a paragraph. That's what it is. Now, do you guys understand the premise of this thing? So, first of all, you got to understand what makes a valid argument. If this, if the premises are true, this will be true as well. But we're supposing, what if this was false? So we said, what if this is false? Okay, if this is false, then this statement here, which is true, right? Remember, if this is a true statement and Q is false, that means P has to be false. But how can P be false? Because right here it says P is true. That's your contradiction. And when you have a contradiction, that means what you supposed in the beginning is, not, that is wrong. That means Q is not false. It's true, which makes the argument valid. Okay, let's look at another one. Some of you are befuddled, yeah? Let's look at another one. Okay, let's look at the law of syllogism. B implies Q. Q implies R. Therefore, what? What can be concluded from this? P implies R. This is the law of syllogism. Now, remember, what is a valid argument? If this is true and this is true, then that will be true as well. Okay, so what's the first sentence in this? Suppose what? P implies R is false. Whatever is here, you're, we're going to suppose that what happens if this is false? Okay? Suppose this is false. Now, if a conditional statement is false, can we make any, any conclusions from that? When is the only time a conditional statement is false? When the first one is true and the second one is false. So, P is true and R is false. You guys understand that? See, that's why you have to know all your truth tables. The only time a conditional statement is false is when the first one is true and the second one is false. So now you take these things back into here until you get a contradiction. And you will get a contradiction because we already know this is a valid argument. Okay, where do you want to take it? Which one do you want to do? Okay, okay. P is true. Now, if this is a conditional statement that we know to be true, 
if P is true, can we make any conclusions about Q? Yeah, Q has to be true, right? Because if you have a conditional statement that is true, if the first one is true, the second one has to be true, right? Because if the second one is false, doesn't that mean the whole thing is false? Yeah, so Q has to be true. So, so thus, thus, Q has to, let's just say Q is true in premise number one. Okay, now we know Q is true. Now look at premise number two. What? Look, we know this to be a true statement. This is a conditional statement. If this is a true statement and the first one is true, then the second one has to be true. So hence, hence, R is true in premise number two. Anybody see a contradiction? Where? Where's the contradiction? Right here. R is false, but then over here it says R is true. That's the contradiction. So, contradiction. We're happy about it, so we put an exclamation mark. R cannot be both true and false. Therefore, the argument is valid. And there you go, that's the end of the proof. You guys get it? The first sentence is always whatever is here, whatever the conclusion is, you suppose that it's false. Then you take that information back up to, into here until you get a contradiction. And there you go. So, tonight, where's, where's, oh, look at tonight's homework. We only got five minutes left. What is tonight's homework? What does it say on the top? Logic. Logic. Now, this is the actual test that I gave, it's probably 20 years ago. This is an actual test, okay? Now, before you take a test, usually I will give you one or two practice tests, so that, because if some of you went into it cold, you, it'll just be pain, yeah? So I'm going to give you an actual test. Are there answers on the bottom? No. No. You guys are going to write your answers on the board tomorrow when you come in, and then I will correct it just like I correct the real test, so you can see how I, how I think. You know what I'm talking about? So then when you take the real test on Thursday, you're more at ease, hopefully. Okay, so let's decide who's putting the problems on the board. How many problems are there? Seven. What? Seven. Keep scrolling up. Seven. Okay, but yeah, but see, one, eight. Okay, number one is six individual problems. Where do I see six people? There's 13. Somebody's missing. Huh? Oh, somebody's missing back there. Are you sitting in the right seat? Yeah. Oh, maybe not. Strike one, Morisada. But then you already had two strikes. I had one strike. No, but then the second strike, because you, you're supposed to tell me that you're missing class on Friday. <laughs> Sit in your seat. Okay. So I see six people here. Three and three. Yeah, but that's number one. Number one got to be easy, right? Okay. okay, and then we got two A and B. Three, four, five, A, B, C, six, seven. So there's eight more problems. Where do I see eight people? Who's missing right here? She dropped the class. Oh, that's the new row. Um, oh, okay, four and four right there. Okay, here. So you guys do like two through seven right here, these two. Whichever one you want. So when you come into class tomorrow, it'll be on the board, like it'll be over there. One A B C D E F. So just go to whichever problem you want and then fill it in. We just give them the answer on the board. I want to see what you're gonna to present to me on the test, and I'll grade it. I'll pro you will see how I grade it. Are you sure it works? No. Yeah. Do you? No, no, no. Just do whatever you're gonna do on the test, and I'll, I'll show you how I grade it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. So that's what's happening tomorrow. So tomorrow I will pass back the quiz, and then we need to, uh, I, I just glanced at the quizzes, we need to like make some adjustments. Curve, There's no curve, I give you guys three points. Ow!